Welcome in everyone to the Larson Land podcast. I'm your host Sawyer Hill and I'm joined as always by my co-host Dylan Bradshaw. We come in here every single week and talk about all things involving the 2021 NASCAR Cup Series champion, Young Money Kyle Larson. Uh, a tale of two races for Kyle Larson out at the Circuit of the Americas this past weekend. Uh, Young Money was able to pick up the win in the Xfinity Series race, a really exciting race on Saturday. And then on Sunday on the cup side, it was uh, definitely left uh, a lot to be desired. It was a, a 17th place finish at the end of the day for Kyle. But um, let's let's talk about the Xfinity race first, Dylan. Um, what were your thoughts on that one? Yeah, uh, he, like you said, he picked up his 15th Xfinity victory, his second on road course. It, it was starting off good on the weekend. Um, he got the pole over, over Van Gisbergen. But uh, unfortunately, we saw he, you know, before the race started, he was starting in the rear, had a cracked brake rotor. Um, you know, it's it's not good to start in the rear at a road course, but um, he was able, you know, to make his way up. Um, following stage one, we, we had our, you know, normal reports of engine issues. It seems to be a pretty common occurrence for Larson when, he, when he's in the next Xfinity car. But um, he's able to get in front of Vangus Bergen in the pit cycle before the end of stage two. Um, got that P5 in stage two. It was pretty pretty smooth sailing um, for, for SVG there. Um, you know, throughout, it, it was kind of him and Almendinger battling there at the end of the stage. Four to go. Um, SVG, you know, he, he fell victim to classic NASCAR overtime. He, he's new to NASCAR. He finally got his taste of the of the NASCAR overtime treatment. Um, there was fluid on the track. Larson's P5 at that point. And uh, he, he pitted there with the, with the flat spot in his tire before the start of overtime. Back in 24th, seemed like he was, you know, complete non-factor. I mean, 24th with three to go, but, you know, I guess you can never count him out. Saw cautions in OT, restarted again, uh, restarted 10th in double OT. And then, you know, from there, I mean, it was just Larson, you know, doing his thing. Um, you know, Hill broke away, had a nice lead. Um, you know, SVG eventually caught up during that lap. Larson was on the prowl, fresher tires, of course. It was kind of, you know, maneuvering, waiting for Hill and SVG to make a mistake. Obviously, that's what happened, and you know, was was able to pick up the twenty fourth, the first victory. Just insane. Um, did did not think it was it was possible at all. You know, starting twenty fourth in OT, um, it, it just kind of seemed pretty chalk from that point. But um, and and by the way, another another point, SVG, he did finish second, but he actually ultimately ended up finishing twenty seventh because right. of a penalty for cutting the course on that last lap. So such a good day for SVG. Had the win right in front of him. Four laps to go, ruined, and then, you know, got the second in OT, got kind of screwed again, put the penalty, finished 27th. So it is it, it is cool to see SVG, you know, kind of dominating the way he is. I mean, he's been in, you know, NASCAR not very long at all, picked up the his first one last year at the Chicago Racing Cup. And, um, you know, ever since he's kind of made an impact, he's he has a top five on an oval. So um, pretty interesting stuff from him. Yeah, well, and, and you know, it was, it was interesting to see, like, from from the side of of like Vangus Bergen, Larson, uh, you know Gibbs and Almondinger, those were like the four main players in the Xfinity race, and then it was interesting to see what uh, they did on the Cup side of things the, uh, on Sunday. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We'll also talk about some of that uh, course cutting stuff. A lot of penalties for cutting the course. A lot of conversation about that on Twitter. Um, but I want to go back to that that call from Greg Ives. Greg Ives was the crew chief on the 17 car in Xfinity for Kyle this weekend, uh, making the call there w right at the end of the race from fifth to pit, go all the way back to 24th and ultimately win the race. I mean, what a gutsy call from him. You know, obviously the 17 car is out there to win races. They're not racing for points, anything like that. So if they don't think that they can win, they're going to try and make a move to do it. And I, and I totally respect that. I, I think a lot of people were like, man, you're going to give up fifth to, to go all the way to their back. But um, it just seems like it's so much easier to pass in the Xfinity car than what it is in the cup. Maybe that's, uh, you know, a, a, a product of the level of competition. Maybe that's that's what you could attribute that to. But, uh, you know, I don't know. The cars are so similar in the cup side that you get mired back in traffic. It's really hard to make up ground and get back up there. And, you know, Kyle just he fought his way through. It, it was awesome to watch. Um, I was on the edge of my seat right there at the end of the race coming to the white flag. You know, you even 
you really didn't even think Kyle had a chance. I mean, you even you said you you had somewhere to be, and you uh, you left right before the start of that last overtime, didn't you, Dylan? <laughs> yeah, I checked on my phone. Yeah, I saw the post come up, the the results. Just said like from rear to first for the victory. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, what happened? It was like as soon as I left, I thought it was pretty much over. Um, I mean, I, I think you can kind of, you know, with the Xfinity side of things. I mean, in comparison to Cup, part of it too is. Cup had no natural cautions at yeah. all, all day on Sunday. So, I mean, just in overtime alone, I mean, like I said, he started 24th in the in the first overtime, worked his way up, and he was given the chance again. I mean, he restarted 10th in double overtime, made up 14 spots. Um, so, I mean, that definitely gave him a chance for sure. And then, like I said, on the fresher tires, um, he just kind of had an advantage of everyone, not only the tires, but because he's Kyle Larson and he, <laughs> he was able to make his way through the field. So it's nothing we haven't seen before. Um, I just definitely thought it, w- it was over, you know, starting oh, yeah. 20, 24th with three to go. I mean, it's it, it's definitely insane. And it was cool to see, always cool to see in the number 17, um, you know, paying homage to, to Ricky Hendrick. Always love the, the post-race pictures they post when when they get that car in victory lane. It's it's cool to see. Um, wish, wish we saw something like that on Sunday, though. I mean, Sunday, it was definitely... Um, definitely not as exciting. I mean, like I said, no natural cautions whatsoever. Um, it wasn't, wasn't a strong, strong, you know, day going into it. I mean, he wasn't too fast in practice. He was, he was ninth fastest, 15th in qualifying. So, you know, starting, starting that far back in the field in cup on a road course, you're kind of already setting up for, for not too good of a day, but, um, he was definitely competing. I mean, they're they're up at the front of the pack until you know we saw Bell ultimately spin mm-hmm. Larson in stage two. Um, that was pretty much the end of his day. He just he just couldn't really make his way back up. Just sitting in the teens, the twenties, the rest of the day, and you know again nobody really had any chance to catch up with no cautions. I mean, we only had the the stage cautions, so it really doesn't give any guys that you know may have had a fast car too much of a chance. It was just Byron and Bell domination pretty much most of the day. Yeah, and obviously you had Byron and Bell on two little bit differing strategies throughout the race. Kind of interesting to see how that played out at the end with Bell coming, you know, really close to to Byron at the end. Maybe a couple more laps and he would have had the win over Byron. Who knows? But um, kind of kind of going back to the no cautions thing, I saw a lot of people after the the spin caused by Christopher Bell. A lot of people on Twitter were complaining about the strategy calls from Cliff Daniels atop the box. And I think in a race like that, where you don't have the natural cautions, it's really hard to play out a race with, with uh, getting on a, so to, so to say, a, a different strategy than um, any other drivers. You can't really get different in a race when there's no opportunities to do that. There's no cautions um, where you can maybe pit when other guys uh stay out or or vice versa and you know they they decided to go for fuel only on the one stop a lot of people were were not sure of that uh decision i think it was just hey we're gonna we're gonna try to make it longer in this fuel run but leapfrog a couple guys on the pit cycle and hope for a a caution to come out soon uh right after that right after that stage two finish and it of course didn't happen there was no caution that came out so um, just, just interesting, uh, throughout the race, you know, I, I think these, these road courses, I think the, the one, this one especially is, is way too long of a race. The Xfinity race was seem like a perfect length. This, this track is huge. I mean, over two minute laps is insane. And, um, it, I think just after a while, it's like, man, the race has already been decided. Like Byron just, he was dominant all day and you could see the guys that were in the back, they didn't have much of an opportunity, like you said, to get to the front. The race was pretty much decided uh, halfway through, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the race was, was pretty much like unwatchable. I mean, as far as the racing side of things, I mean, outside of the the movers we saw on, on the restarts going in turn one, there was really nothing happening like all day. Yeah. Um, just, just pretty much just a snooze fest. I mean... Like we just said, Byron and Bell, they pretty much were, were just the two. Bell, he he did have the fresher tires. He played the strategy good there at the end. Um, I, I think he shaved like a five-second lead to like under a second in, in like four or five laps or something there at the end. So I, I do think if, you know, there were some cautions, Bell definitely probably would have won the race. But 
Um, you know, ultimately it's just just Byron picking up that win. Byron just two wins on the season already. Day ten to five hundred in Coda. Um, picking up right where he left off from last year. Um, really, really didn't didn't fade at all. I mean, he's just proven that he's he's becoming an, an alpha. I guess you could say in the cup side of things. And um, it seems like him and him and Larson are you know at the at the top of Hendrick right now again. Um, kind of a lackluster performance from from the nine team. Really not sure what's what's going on there. I mean, you you expect a guy like Chase Elliott to to kind of thrive at these types of races at Coda. Um, he, he's proven to be very good at road courses in the past. So I was kind of expecting for, for Coda to kind of be one of his bounce back races, you know, maybe maybe pick it up a top five there. But um, I don't know. I, I'm, we kind of talked about him. I'm, I'm curious to see if whether the nine team is kind of going to get back on get back on track to their old selves. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, I think the interesting thing for Chase Elliott is, I'm looking it up right now, is like in the next-gen car, what his, you know, he was, he was everybody talked about him as being the, the best guy on the road courses, but really in the next-gen car, I don't even know what, how many wins, do you know how many wins he has on a road course in the next-gen? That's kind of what I'm looking uh, at right now. I'm not sure, right I think now. he was- his last his last win was I think Talladega of twenty twenty two and then he won that Atlanta race in twenty twenty two. I can't remember if he had another win or not in twenty two because he obviously didn't have one last year. Right, I'm looking right now. Um, yeah, so Man. he won. He won at Talladega. He won at Atlanta, Nashville, and at Dover. So. Even yeah, so in twenty two, so he hasn't won on a road course uh, since the start of the next gen car. So I mean, you know, that's it's just interesting to me to see like that that big of a of a difference. I mean, I would argue even Larson hasn't been as good on the road courses as what he was in twenty twenty one. We saw him, you know, really kill it in twenty one on the road courses, and since then he's been he's been good, better than Elliott, I would say, but. Um, the only race I guess we saw Elliot kind of competitive on a road course was at Watkins Glen. What was it last year at Watkins Glen when uh, him and uh, him and Kyle had the controversy? Or was that the year before? I I can't remember. I mean, there's been a handful it's, of controversies yeah, between Elliot and Larson. So Lewis, many. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean the the one. I mean, I can't. Re- I keep remembering Fontana that opening race of the of the next gen. That's that's the, that was the big one. That was the big one that kind of caused commotion between the two. Right. Um, kind of, kind of talking a little bit on some of those other drivers, like I said, from the Xfinity race, you know, Ty Gibbs, he had a solid, another solid day on the cup side. He was kind of the only one of the, the double duty guys to really be solid on both sides. Um, SVG and Almondinger both in the colleague cars. They didn't have, you know, any anything outstanding on the cup side like they were in Xfinity. You know, SVG had some some issues in the cup race. I think he was he didn't have first gear for the majority of the, the race, the second half of the race. So uh, kind of a rough day for him. Um, looking at my notes here, the track limits penalties. I, I think everybody on Twitter was really uptight about these penalties and the, the, there were so many of them throughout the three uh series races this weekend my thing about that is you know on a road course there has to be track limits you can't just have guys, have guys cutting the course and there has to be a line where nascar says okay this guy was he was clearly over the limits four tires off the track it's got to be a penalty they have to enforce it at some point and whether you like it or not whether it affects a driver negatively or not you, you can't argue that the only time i will say speaking going back to chase elliott there was a there was a uh, situation in the race on sunday where chase elliott was forced off track by another driver and then he got the penalty for the the cutting the course because he was completely off but he got forced off so i mean nascar obviously needs to to l- take a look at things like that and you know not penalize a guy for getting shoved off the track but um I kind of I kind of compare this to like the double yellow line rule on the super speedways where you can't pass below the double yellow line. You know, if if you get forced below the double yellow line and and it's not your fault, you're you're not penalized for it there. You shouldn't be uh at a road course either. 
Yeah, I think there was I think there was seventeen in the Xfinity. I think there was twenty in truck. I'm not sure how many there there were in the cup race. It didn't seem but... like it was as many on the cup side. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't know. I mean you I do agree you have to have track limits. I, I kind of think back to that. Um I think it was Chastain, that one indie road course race where he just oh, yeah. drove past everyone to the lead. <laughs> I mean, imagine you just had no track limits and he just cuts past everyone on the turn um and, and you know just takes the lead so yeah you do have to have track limits um it is it is annoying like you just mentioned i mean you forced out you really have no choice which i think back to that indie road course race i mean there was a there's a few instances because there was a lot of a lot of contact in the in those indie races and um that kind of forces guys out and they they can't really you know follow the racing line so they definitely should not be penalized for it so um they they should probably look into it review it um, make sure that there was, you know, they, they did just straight up cut the course to, you know, gain advantage. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, you do have to have track limits. It, if not, it would just be absolute mayhem. Guys would just be cutting the corners, um, cut people off. So, um, yeah, you, you definitely have to have them. And, and I guess the other side of this, the other argument is instead of having the track limits on those areas to have some kind of the curbs or those little turtle things on the corners, we saw what those did at Indy Road Course multiple times. Mayhem, absolute chaos, ripping them up off the track. These cars are are not built to to race with those types of uh, obstacles, so to say, with the with the front splitter and and everything like that. Um, you know, an open wheel car, it's it's no problem. They they just you know hit it, hit it and drive over it, but. Um, that that one in the I don't know what turn it is at Indy, but that was like the that one year it was just a ramp. Like the guys, there was so many pictures of cars just hitting it and being completely off the ground and causing huge incidents in that that one turn there. I remember it was really bad too. At I think it was yeah twenty twenty two the year Larson didn't make it past at the Roval. I remember there were like a ton of like cautions at the Roval for for those bumps and um, there was just a ton of stuff happening. I remember there was like. Also, not unrelated. I mean, there was like a ton of stuff blowing onto the track. I think there was like tents and stuff. But I, I'm pretty sure there was like a good handful of of cautions. You know, guys, you know, ripping parts of the car off on those on those little bumps around the turns. Yeah. Um. I mean, these honestly, all like overall, these these road course races. I mean, what do you think? I mean, I I mean, we probably talked about this a handful of times on the podcast, but. You know, how many, there's a there's too many road course races on the schedule in my opinion right now. Um, you know, we had like in my opinion, Road America was was a good one. It, it just seemed like a a good one for NASCAR. Coda just seems too much for me. It's too much for me. It's not just like a like an old school NASCAR style road course. It's not like a Sonoma or Watkins Glen. Like I can get behind those. I can get behind uh you know like a road america or something like that but like i'm glad indy's going back to the oval this year no matter how bad or boring that race ends up being it can't be worse than another road course on the schedule yeah indy road course is probably like the most (laughs) unwatchable race that they probably is on the schedule um, you know, after watching this Coda race, I, I honestly say it wasn't wasn't too far behind. Which, <laughs> I mean, again, going back to it, I mean, there was no natural cautions. I think that really is a is a big thing. But overall, I just don't enjoy watching road courses personally. They're they're usually always snooze fest for the most part, especially in the next gen. I mean, I could I could sit down and watch them fine. You know, in the in the 2021, you know, the Gen Six car. I mean, there was. I mean, I remember Larson. I mean, he would sweep the stages. You cannot do that no. in the next game car. I mean, you could just go from the rear all the way to the front and win the race. I mean, you cannot do that. Um, it's all about strategy and, and, you know, where you are at the time. And, um, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely need to lower the, the road courses, I would say. I mean, two to two to three, I would say, is, is you know, a good yeah. a good setting point. And, you know, I, I would agree. Watkins Glen, Sonoma, those are those are two of my favorite ones. But, you know, any road course, I hope that never comes back. <laughs> um, Coda, I mean, honestly, I, I can't imagine. I, I don't know the numbers, but I can't imagine they got very good ratings after after that race Sunday. So maybe that's one they need to we need to read to consider. But, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for less road courses for sure. Absolutely. So looking ahead on the NASCAR Cup Series schedule for Kyle Larson, uh, we have the Richmond Raceway on Sunday night, the uh, a night race this year. 
Larson, of course, the defending winner of the spring race there. I'll be there again this year in the spring uh, for my first cup race of the the year. Um, looking forward to seeing anybody out there at the track. I know last year at Richmond, it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, a lot of people coming up and, and saying something to me, like wearing the Larson Land stuff. So um, if you're a listener of the podcast, going to be at Richmond Raceway on Sunday, uh, and you see me around, stop and say hi, send us a message, maybe uh, maybe we'll be able to meet, meet up or something at some point. Uh, hopefully going to get there a little bit early. I know the race doesn't start till 7, but, um, you know, I want to get, I don't know what the, we were just talking about it before the show, the, the HendrickCars.com, the home hats, every week they've been pretty good so far this year. Hopefully a good one for Richmond. Hope maybe can snag one of those on Sunday. <laughs> Yeah, those those hats. I mean, people go people go crazy for the Larson hats. I mean, I I just told you. I mean, I have the the few of the twenty twenty one hats, and I mean, you could you could go on eBay and guys are selling them two three hundred dollars back when they were back when they're even more rare. So it's cool that they're finally you know every race you know every every home race you could they have a new new hat that comes out gives gives guys that go to the the track a chance to get one and um, you know they're pretty cool, but. Other than that, I mean, strong at Richmond, like you said, he, he picked up that that win in the spring race. Um, his other win, his other one there is the in 2017. I think that was the fall race with Chip Ganassi. But um, you know, last year in the fall race, he started 14th, finished 19th. Hopefully, a, a better outcome than that. Going to be interesting to see it, you know, at the at nighttime. I mean, that's something we really don't see too often there at Richmond. So that's going to be pretty cool to see. Um, you you did just tell me that they're going to have the Phoenix tires there, unfortunately. So. Yeah. Um, really, really not, you know, hopes aren't too high for, for uh-huh. some insane race. I'd be nice if they maybe brought the Bristol tires or maybe a slightly harder Bristol tire that race. It'd be, it'd be pretty fun to see at night at, at Richmond, but, um, I think they're, they're gonna, you know, kind of step away from that direction and keep, keep it a little bit more conservative from here on out. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love to see, you know, either a bring the Bristol tire or B put maybe put resin on the track and see how like a a harder tire reacts with the resin. Like they did, like they, uh, like we saw at Bristol, but, um, obviously we're not going to get any of that. So it's going to be the tire from Phoenix. And, you know, the thing I'm kind of thinking about with that is like, man, this is a good opportunity for Hendrick motorsports to kind of reevaluate like what they brought to Phoenix. Cause we know Richmond's, you know, Richmond's a, a, you know, a mile track, just like, uh, like like Phoenix and you know it's it's probably the most similar to Phoenix that we see throughout the year it's not not exactly the same you know Phoenix is a very interesting shaped track but of the tracks that we'll see you know it's going to be probably closest um closest to Phoenix on the schedule so with how bad Hendrick Motorsports was there you know not no better way to put it but they were just bad at Phoenix a couple weeks ago so hopefully they can bring something a little bit better to the track on Sunday I'm hoping so I know everybody else is too um not too often does Hendrick Motorsports bring two duds in a row yeah I mean just just Chevy in general I mean that was just pathetic showing at Phoenix I mean it was just Ford and Toyota, Toyota really, really dominated. So I'm kind of expecting a, you know, probably a Denny Hamlin, you know, situation at Richmond. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Um, <laughs> you know, unfortunate, unfortunate, but would not be surprised to see Hamlin, you know, dominate at Richmond. Hopefully, hopefully Chevy can put it together. Um, you know, Larson, he's definitely been stronger on on these short tracks um, in, in the next gen. So like we said, picked up that that spring race there at Richmond. So. Um, looking forward to it. Hopefully, we get a good qualifying spot, and uh, you know we can we can you know go go forward and, and pick up another win. Absolutely. So, uh, looking at the random Kyle Larson race of the week, wrapping up today's show. Um, the this week's race comes from the 2017 season uh, on May 7th at Talladega Super Speedway, and. I know what you're probably already thinking as a Larson fan, probably thinking DNF, probably thinking he got in a big crash at some point, but no, it was a 12th place finish for Kyle Larson behind the wheel of the Chip Ganassi Racing number 42 car uh, there at Talladega. I 
Didn't watch the full highlights video, but I will link that down below in the YouTube uh, description. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. actually was the winner of that race driving uh, for Roush Fenway Racing. So uh, check that out if you want to. If not, it's a boring super speedway race at Talladega, and I don't blame you. But um, that's the random Kyle Larson race of the week. And Dylan, unless you had anything else for today, I think that should pretty much wrap up today's show. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what's more surprising. He finished at Talladega. <laughs> it wasn't a 2011 race that you gave us to. Yeah, you know, to right. Talk about. <laughs> but yeah, that, that should pretty much wrap it up. Um, you know, as always, thanks everyone for the support. Um, be sure to leave your comments about Coda. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we're just some negative nancies about, <laughs> about these road courses in Coda, but um, we'd love to hear hear everyone else's opinion on it. You know, should we lower road courses? Is there anything we can we can fix? You know, make it make it more watchable, more racy. Um, be sure to leave that below, you know, in, in YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, post the thumbnail, you know, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. So if you have any, have any thoughts, be sure to comment there as well. But, um, you know, other than that, we'll, we'll see y'all in the next video next week. Thanks again, everyone for tuning in and listening to today's show. We'll be back again next week to recap Richmond and any other Kyle Larson news that may come about. If you're watching on YouTube, like this video and subscribe. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please don't forget to follow our podcast so you never miss a thing. Hope you guys have a great rest of the week and we will see you in the next episode.